It's now, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Don Coxstad, who's going to talk about the West African isomer. Okay, Don, 30 minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes. Some of the slides would be helpful. Well, I, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Agre, Dean Clagg, and everybody else who has worked hard to put this together. And I will close at the end by having a chance to thank my colleagues with whom we've worked in West Africa. As shown on this first title slide, the West African isomer, uh, let's see, There we are. Is in Gambia, is in Senegal, and is in Mali. Three contiguous countries in West Africa, and it involves a number of sites in these three different countries. I will show you a map of that. And it involves 53 different investigators, so it's been a fairly substantial undertaking. At each of the four field sites, there have been prospective studies looking at smear positivity, at disease, and at mosquito characteristics like numbers of mosquitoes and infection and so on. And those cohorts have each had about 1,500 people enrolled in them. So there are a substantial number of people who've been followed. The four sites were chosen to be different. The first is an urban site in the city of Chess, which is about 60, 70 kilometers directly east of Dakar in Senegal. The second is a rural site with low transmission in the Gambia, which is viewed and views themselves as being in pre-elimination. And then there are sites in Mali which have more intense transmission and are certainly not in pre-elimination. The only other data I will try to present are a summary of a study looking at the treatment of the most common form of malaria, uncomplicated malaria, and the most common way to treat it, which is with an oral combination that's available in large parts of the world. If, as we move here, this is the urban site. Here's Dakar. This is Chess, 60, 70 kilometers east. This is the rural site with relatively low seasonal transmission in the Gambia at Gambasara. This is a high intensity transmission site along the Niger River at the village of Dangasa, which as you will see has persistent high levels of infection throughout the year. And this is a site at Joro which was under excellent control because of the efforts of the Millennium Villages Project for almost 10 years. And then their funding ended and control fell apart. And so we unfortunately were in the position of gathering data about what happened when the control fell apart. The uh, urban site in Senegal has a very low incidence of infection. And within the city of Chess, this community of Medina Fall has several zones which move from relatively urban or peri-urban areas in zones one and two to virtually rural areas in zone three. And as you'll see on the next slide, the prevalence of, or the prevalence of infection was clearly highest and was marked when we began in zone three. 
And you can see that after the first year, those differences disappeared. What happened in this first year in April is there was a bed net distribution at this point, and that appears to have really had a powerful impact. There was also an area of transmission discovered in zone three, and that was dealt with. And so the prevalences of infection that you're looking at here are extremely low. To give you an example, on a smear survey of 1,700 subjects, on the order of three or four positive slides from the whole collection. This contrasts markedly with studies some of you have seen, and which we'll talk about briefly at the end, in which CHESS focuses or serves as a referral center. And in that case, hundreds and at times thousands of people with malaria are coming to a clinic there, entering studies, but they're coming from a wide area. And so what you're looking at here are all data corrected to the cohort. So these are cases deriving only from the geographic area that was being studied. If we switch then to the Gambia, in the dry season, it is almost as if malaria does not exist at times in the Gambia. The incidence of infection and disease both increase strikingly during the rainy season, and the prevalence of inf infection can actually approach the levels seen in areas with intense transmission, such as the two sites in Mali, Dangasa and Joro. And at the third bullet here is something mentioned by other speakers, and that is the observed patterns when one looks at this relatively small community are by no means homogeneous. There are some striking heterogeneities which are probably telling us things we should understand better than we do. Here are data for three consecutive years. GMB is for the town of Gambasara, which for this area is a relatively urban area. And you can see by the bars that the prevalence of infection there is low on the order generally of around 5% smear positivity, which is quite low. The four hamlets that we're talking about are divided into two groups. And this one on the right, you'll see, has a very striking vector density and is quite near the breeding sites or the putative breeding sites, but yet has a much lower prevalence of infection. In other words, in a counterintuitive sense, there's a dissociation between the magnitude of the vector population, which is also true for the biting rates, and the prevalence of infection, which one would ordinarily expect to follow. The proposed explanation is from the work of a number of entomologists in West Africa, including Kaluzzi and Toure, which suggests that if you're very close to a breeding site, that the competition for survival among those mosquitoes with large numbers coming off may be so intense that survival is very short and simply does not reach the time required to fulfill the extrinsic incubation period. And that is the presumed reason, at least at this point, for that dissociation. The second slide here is an attempt to get at the EIRs, and one can see that in the town of Gambasara, where the rates are low, those EIRs are also low, and they're much higher in the surrounding hamlets. So we have this one dissociation I've already mentioned, and here there's a second dissociation. Again, many of you may know about the work in Burkina Faso uh, and other places 
suggesting that the Fulani are genetically resistant or at least more resistant to infection than other populations in West Africa. And in this case, the Fulani are actually in the hamlets in the rural areas, and they're the ones who are being infected at greater rates. So that likewise is counterintuitive, and it presumably reflects these differences in the EIR and in the environment, which presumably in this case are overwhelming the relative genetic protection afforded, afforded to the Fulani. The next site moves then to the two sites in Mali. And Dangasa is an example of something that was reasonably common 10 to 20 or 30 years ago and is increasingly less common today. That is a community where 45% or more of the people are carrying parasites essentially year round. And that's what one sees uh, in this community despite the apparent seasonal nature of transmission. On the second bullet, the traditional malaria control strategies that are recommended by WHO and implemented by most countries in this region, which are also implemented here, are obviously not doing the job. ACTs are being provided for treatment of malaria. Insecticide-treated nets are being provided an IPT or intermittent protective treatment during pregnancy is being provided, but still the levels of infection remain high. Now, I can mention, but the data will not focus on, there is evidence if you look with molecular markers of new infections that keep occurring even during the dry season at a time when for years our entomologists could not find mosquitoes. And so we actually began to question whether our molecular markers were wrong and misleading us. And it turned out the molecular markers were right, that those new infections were indeed real, and that careful marked release recapture experiments showed that this community about five kilometers away from the Niger River was seeing transmission from little pockets where there was persistent breeding as the river receded during the dry season and that those mosquitoes would then migrate. So that was actually a, a reassuring confirmation of the molecular data. And like other places in West Africa where the, trans, where the infection, whoops, can I go back? Can I go back one? No. No. Can you make it go back? Back. Okay, yeah. Other places in West Africa, the peak of human disease is at the end of the rainy season. That is an observation that's been made for a long time, beginning 50, 60 years ago, never adequately explained, and appears to recur despite the fact that the levels of infection, the prevalence of positive smears, is, is stable in the population the peak of disease is clearly at the end of the season. Now these are some data from Dangasa, and as you look at this plot by age groups, you can see that if you start at the under fives, those children are 40% or higher, and they stay, there we are, high throughout the year. The same thing is true for the children from five to nine, and the same thing is true for the children 10 to 14. People 20 and over, they are slightly lower. 
And then something happened after the use of SMC here. There was a seasonal malaria chemo prevention here. The prevalence of infection fell, but look how fast it rebounded. So at least several applications of SMC, they did produce an immediate response, but there clearly was a substantial rebound in this case. Now this is the other site in Mali, and this is the site where we had the unpredicted and unexpected experiment. The MVP program was a very successful program in that it actually eliminated the peak of disease at the middle or the late part of the transmission season. And for the nine or more years, almost 10 years preceding the loss of funding, the prevalence of infection in the community actually became lower during the peak of the transmission season than it was at the beginning. So this was a, essentially a nuclear bomb of anti-malarial strategy that was having an overwhelming effect. And that began in 2007, prior to which time our studies and others suggested that the average prevalence of infection was around 70 to 80 percent in the community. And then in June of 2014, funding stopped and everything just rebounded. So this was a very striking and discomforting uh, experiment in terms of what can happen uh, when funding is stopped. In this case, it was exacerbated because a lot of the rest of the health infrastructure was also dependent on this funding and clearly demonstrated that although the program had reduced the prevalence of infection, it appeared to have been suppressing what was going on not interrupting transmission or making transmission go away. If we move from the slides I've shown so far, which were primarily for infection or smear positivity, the slides coming up here are looking at disease. And so you can see in the sawtooth pattern across the top of the slide, the pronounced seasonal variation in Dangasa in the incidence of disease. These are again corrected to be only for the cohort population we were following. So they're true incidence numbers in cases per thousand per month during that period. And you can see that sawtooth pattern. You can see that it was absent. It was not present in Joro until Joro lost funding and then there was a rebound shortly after. In terms of Medina Fall, really almost undetectable, and there were substantial numbers of cases in the Gambia in that first transmission season, and after the bed net distribution, they appeared to go away. So that appeared to be an effective intervention as well. This is the same approach to looking at severe malaria in those populations. The incidence of severe malaria is almost undetectable in Medina Fall, is very low in Gambia, which you can see, and does not come up until funding is stopped in Joro, but continues the same sawtooth pattern uh, in the Gambia, uh, in Dangasa. In the few slides coming up, I'd like to talk about a study that we looked at in terms of the oral treatment of uncomplicated malaria because it's the most common form of malaria. Treatment is oral. It could be watched without doing, in essence, a clinical trial. But we did really want the answers to two questions. One was, 
was the treatment in use working, which was primarily either the Novartis form or another company form of Artemether plus Lumafantrin, which has the trade name when it's Novartis of Coartem, and whether there were late recurrences. We were obviously also concerned about the arrival of artemisinine resistance and whether there was any evidence of the parasites that had been seen in Southeast Asia. These are the composite data, and the data from Senegal are the easiest to follow, and it's clear that the success of treatment was high. If one looks at the data for the Gambia and for Mali, the uh, issue is what one does with the recurrences that were then negative when you did the PCR. In other words, they were clearly new infections rather than a recurrence of the in initial infection. In that case, one could then move these numbers from 64 and 88 percent effectively to 100 percent in terms of the efficacy of the treatment. So it appears to be working, and I'm not going to show any of the data, but the result of several studies has been that there are point mutations which have been found in the Kelch-13 propeller domain, but none of those mutations are the same mutations that are, appear to be causing resistance to the artemisinines in Southeast Asia. So those specific four or five point mutations do not yet appear to be in this part of West Africa. Our conclusions at this moment, uh, clearly there are areas where transmission persists despite all conventional approaches. Uh, the experience in the Gambia really causes us to focus, and I think Dr. Moss talked about this earlier on, on the transition that one has as control improves and the numbers go down, you actually begin to see problems you did not know were ever there, like the inadequate sensitivity of both your smear and your rapid diagnostic test. Those are clearly issues which need to be examined. Chess and Medina Fall then become an area with minimal transmission and importation becomes a major concern in those areas. We talked about the dependence on outside funding, and I've already alluded to the findings on sequencing. I, I'd like to finish by pointing out that uh, this has been a project uh, where actually I've been overseas in West Africa for six months of the year for the last six years but I'm not the one who's doing the work. The people who are doing the work are on these slides. This is the team in the Gambia, Davis and Makama, who's been hands-on leading it. Alfred and Gua has done molecular and immunologic studies which were not presented today. Abdullahi Ahmad did the epidemiology. Musa Jawara did the entomology. Muna Afara worked with Davis and Abdullahi to put those together, and as you know, Umberto is the director of the MRC at this time. Some of our team in Senegal, led by Dada and Jaya, and uh, he is the one who really led the Project 3 in particular, looking at the effectiveness of treatment. Jean-Louis and Jaya, who has brought expertise and seasonal malaria chemo prevention, and our two uh, lead statisticians and data managers, Jules Francois Gomez in Senegal and Ayuba Jara in Mali. The Mali team reading across the top, lead of epidemiology, Seydou Dumbia, uh, the leader for the Dangasa site, and the immunology studies, Mal Mohamedou uh, and Usman Kawita led Project 3. Mohamedou Touré did the epidemiology, and the three people on the bottom 
are the extensive entomology team in Mali, Sheikh Chouari, Mamadou Koulibaly, and Nafamon. The people in the States have included Sarah Folkman and Diane Wirth. Their focus from genomics has been on how can the genomics be brought to the African sites, and that has come to fruition first in Senegal and is now beginning to come to fruition at the other sites. Jeff Schaefer is a statistician, and Clint Welty has been the administrator and coordinator. And these final two slides, uh, although there have been some disruptions in Gambia with an election and in Senegal with a president who wanted to take an extra term or pass things to his son, the greatest challenges in terms of chaos have unfortunately been in Mali, has included the Tuaregs in the north, uh, the French jets and others in 2013, and you may recall Ebola, uh, which caused enormous disruption even when there were not large numbers of cases. And these are some slides from the November 20th, 2015 a takeover of the Radisson Hotel, which happened at a time when I was there and was working with the team. Uh, and I think it's a measure of the professional commitment of the team that they continued to focus and on the project the evening of November 20th, despite all the chaos, they enrolled the final patient in a study we'd been working on for a couple of years, and I think that says an enormous amount about their commitment as well as their competence. So I think that's my last slide, and I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take comments. Thanks for the interesting talk. This, uh, I guess a question for all three. I've really enjoyed hearing the interesting observational data. Is there, is there a plan in general to move toward controlled studies that would allow for more definitive conclusions? There, there are sort of allusions to a number of right. interventions in all three talks. But I, as you may or may not know, the, the ground rules for the isomers are that the people involved in the isomers do not determine national policy. So policies are being determined in each of these countries by the ministries of health. But uh, for sure, there are obvious potential steps in the Gambia in terms of where those communities are located and the directions from which the outbreaks appear to come so that interventions at those breeding sites before the start of the rainy season would seem to be a logical strategy. Those are being discussed. We do not know if the government is going to take that up or not. In terms of the sites in Mali, Dangasa is a, an extraordinarily difficult problem, and we do not know yet how well seasonal malaria chemo prevention is going to do, or whether it too is going to fail. In terms of Juro, we've had an initial response. We don't know how long it will last, but I, I think the most important take home lesson from Juro is that although that program was so successful, it destroyed the seasonal peak of disease, which literally went away, what it was actually doing was suppressing because the moment you took the program away, the disease came screaming back. And that certainly raises the question of intervention. In other words, 
none of those three strategies being used most commonly interfere with or interrupt transmission. And I think that surely resonates in Joro, whereas I really did not have time to discuss. It's an area of irrigation near the Niger River where there are 20,000 acres of flooded land for eight to 10 months of the year with sufficient mosquitoes that average biting rates can get to 250 to 300 bites per person per night. And if you take away the water for the irrigation, you take away the food and the ability to live in the area. But some kind of intervention to prevent those huge numbers of mosquitoes from coming off seems appropriate and is under discussion. We do not know what people will be willing to accept. And having lost the funding from the UN for the MVP program, we don't know yet where the funding for that would come. But those are surely the desires. Seydou Dumbia, who was on the Mali slide, uh, is not just the leader for Project One, he's actually the new dean of the Faculty of Medicine and is one of our former students. So that's something that uh, is under active discussion. But we do not have a specific plan yet. I think something's going yeah. on. Thanks very much, Nidiba. And uh, that brings that brings us to the end of the first session.